Great. Well, welcome everyone to today's event on combating sexual harassment in the United Nations. Um, first off, as will be evident, I am not Sarah Taylor, but uh, Sarah unfortunately uh, came down ill today, so I'll be substituting for her. My name is Jake Sherman. I'm the director of IPI's Center for Peace Operations. Let me also start by thanking IPI's co-hosts today, the permanent missions of Israel, Colombia, and Kenya. As evidence continues to emerge on harassment and abuse in the very arenas that are meant to be promoting human rights, today's panel will discuss this issue at the UN, not just in humanitarian crises and conflict-affected situations where the UN has missions and presences overseas, but here at UN headquarters in New York as well. Secretary General Antonio Guterres has expressed his commitment to a zero-tolerance policy and has acknowledged that there remain obstacles to implementing policies that combat sexual harassment at the UN. The complex situations in which UN staff work make a difficult issue even more challenging to address. In the context of Me Too, the hashtag that sparked a global conversation about sexual harassment and abuse, today's event is intended to serve as a starting point for discussion among member states, UN staff, leadership, and civil society. How can we achieve any of the goals we've set out as an international community if it remains culturally and institutionally acceptable to harass and abuse people, including based on gender? When we talk about women in particular, this means the harassment and abuse of more than 50% of the population. Part of our conversation today will look at how we make this moment a movement. How can we achieve a cultural transformation of the UN so that it is responsive to and prioritizes the rights and needs of victims and survivors? This is, of course, an issue of transparency. As a lack of information enables impunity, empowers the perpetrators rather than the victims. So what do we know? And what do we need to know about the scope of this problem? And what interventions need to be made to affect this change? Before introducing our distinguished panel, who will uh, discuss these issues in more depth, let me first invite Ambassador Danny Dannon, the permanent representative of Israel, to make brief opening remarks. Ambassador Dannon, you have the floor. Shalom, good afternoon, distinguished panelist. USG Beagle, with a pleasure meeting you for the first time today. Ambassador Greenan, Ms. Soliciano, thank you for coming from Israel. Ms. Sandler, esteemed guest, thank you all for coming. We are very glad to see that there is such vast interest in this important topic. I would like to thank our partners at IPI, our co-sponsors, the permanent missions of Colombia and the Republic of Kenya and our panelists for helping make this event possible. We are all here today to start a collaborative conversation on sexual harassment in the United Nations, a topic that has barely been addressed and is long overdue. Recently, all of us saw a number of news articles that have revealed that the UN has not been able to escape this global plague. It is up to us the member states, the UN Secretariat, and staff, with the help of civil society actors, to challenge this reality together. It is outrageous that even today, in the age of globalization, innovation, and awareness, on a global scale, humankind is still struggling to cure itself of the scourge of sexual harassment. Perhaps now, with this discussion, gaining momentum worldwide, we will finally come to our collective breakthrough. Israel is committed to combating sexual harassment in all its forms. As you all know, last year we introduced the first UN resolution on preventing and eliminating sexual harassment in the workplace, which was adopted by consensus in the CSW. This was the first step. 
Now is the time to expand this discussion to the UN system at large. We cannot be afraid to address it. We cannot allow for sexual harassment, abuse, violence or misconduct to go unchallenged. People always say that the first step toward healing is recognizing the problem and facing it. That is what we are here to do today. Our panel represents member states, the UN Secretariat and civil society, because we all must come together to start the conversation and work collectively to eliminate sexual harassment in the UN. I sincerely hope today represents a new beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Dannon. Let me now introduce our panel. Um, first, Ms. Jan Beagle, the, under, the United Nations Under Secretary General for Management. Ambassador Koki Grignon, the Deputy Permanent Representative of the Republic of Kenya to the United Nations. Ms. Orit Sulitzano. <laughs> the Executive Director of the Association of Rape Crisis Centers in Israel and Ms. Joanne Sandler, Senior Associate at Gender at Work. Their full bios are in front of you for those of you who are in the room. Uh, each panelist will have around seven minutes for brief remarks followed by questions and comments from the audience. So with that, uh, Under Secretary General Beagle, if I could begin with you, uh, it would be very interesting to hear from you your thoughts on what the scope of the problem at is at the, as the UN understands it, what the challenges are, and how the UN is addressing the problem of sexual harassment. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, Ambassador Daniel, Ambassador Grignon, uh, Orit, and Joanne. It's really uh, a pleasure uh, to be here today, and I think that, uh, as has been said, it's, it's really wonderful to see so many here and from different constituencies because this is an issue that we've got to face together and I think the solution will only be found uh, together. Clearly we're at a pivotal point in terms of looking at this issue. We're really at a time when it has come to the to the top of the of the political agenda, to the top of the media uh, agenda, um, and we are seeing that it is a problem that goes across all sectors. I think that there is no uh, industry which has been exempt uh, from it. There's no culture. There's there's no country. There's no one, however famous. Uh, it is it is an issue that that cuts uh, uh, cuts across and. When we see that Time magazine has uh, the person of the year being the silence breakers, I think that is something that is uh, extremely meaningful because first of all, this is the Time person of the year, so that means that this issue is very high uh, on the international agenda, but also it's the silence breakers because this is an issue which has really been veiled in silence for too long. And it's an issue that really we do need to bring out into the open. So I'm very pleased um, that we are here. And we're here really as a result of courage of people who have come out with the, with the Me Too uh, movement, with the Time's Up movement. And certainly I'm sitting here today um, as, as a senior manager in the UN, but I'm looking at this issue not only from that perspective, but, but as a woman um, and as the, the mother of three daughters. Um, sexual harassment is not only confined to women. There is also sexual harassment often of, of, uh, of young boys and men. However, it's largely uh, an issue um, that relates, uh, relates to women. And I think this is a time we really need to be thinking um, very deeply about this. And it's a time, as the Secretary General has said, that we need to act. And I'd like to talk a little bit um, about what we've been doing in the UN um, over these last months. And it's amazing to think that actually this issue has, has come into provenance only over a few last few months. And yet, quite a lot has already been done, and of course, a lot more uh, yet uh, to be done. Uh, the Secretary General's standpoint is, is very clear, and I think he has made it, he has made it clear. Um, zero tolerance. Clearly, any form of harassment is contrary to the UN values, uh, to the UN standards, to, to really what uh, the UN is about. But the roots of sexual harassment are really in abuse of power. It's all about power imbalances, and um, it's inextricably linked to the way in which we deal with each other, um, in our case, in 
an organization, but overall um, within our societies, uh, wherever those societies are. And so one of the, the underlying um, objectives of the Secretary General when we're addressing this issue is the broader issue of gender parity and empowerment of women. This is a, this is a key uh, issue for the Secretary General. Um, it's needed uh, for, for many reasons in order for us to really to uh, deliver on the SDGs. We believe that we need uh, a, a gender balanced workforce. And uh, he has put in place, as you know, a secretariat-wide gender parity strategy. Um, which is aiming uh, to have parity uh, at all levels. And for the first time in history, just recently, um, he has reached in his senior most management group gender parity. We believe that is very important for, for many reasons, but particularly because one of the major uh, ways to deal with this is to ensure we have a consistent tone from the top. So I think that we are very clear, Secretary General is clear, and uh, the senior managers are, are very clear about his expectations and the expectations that they will cascade down in the organization. Of course, one of the challenges that we have is that the UN Secretariat is the center of the UN system, which, as you know, is, is, is multidimensional, very complex, uh, consisting of numerous entities, many of them with their own governing bodies, certainly their own leadership, different structures, different governance. So often there is a misunderstanding in the outside world of who is doing what. Um, what we are trying to do is to have uh, two tracks, a track for the UN Secretariat, uh, global, and a track for the system, and to bring those two uh, together in, in an uh, integrated way. Also, there's another conflation, which often occurs in, in, in the press in particular, but also in people's minds, I think, between sexual harassment and sexual exploitation and abuse. And uh, sexual exploitation and abuse, as you know, is, is where we have um, abuse of the beneficiaries that we serve. So it is somewhat different from sexual harassment in the workplace, but there are crossovers and a lot of the same uh, ideas and, and concepts are, are relevant. The action that we are taking, first of all, we have actually had a good policy in place since 2008. So we were in advance of many organizations that actually have had no policy. Um, or we have found many um, big companies and, and um, other uh, organizations that we would have thought would have been way in advance. And actually, they didn't have policies. We did have a policy since 2008. And actually, it is, it's quite good. However, we are very aware right, that the level of reporting Right, of uh, sexual harassment and the way in which it is actually being dealt with. So in other words, the way the policy has been implemented uh, needs a lot of improvement. And we need to create an enabling environment where people feel safe to report, where they believe that action will be taken. Because you've got a policy, but if action isn't being taken on that policy or if it's not seen to be taken, then that policy is not strong enough. So as I said, Leadership from the top, first of all, looking at our policy, working in partnership with our staff unions. Way back uh, in October, Secretary General sent out a letter, in, um, a joint letter with all of the staff unions of the Secretariat um, with the zero tolerance uh, issue. And he's also mobilized the senior managers of the Secretariat into a task force. We're meeting regularly uh, to look at all the elements. First thing was the policy, but not only the sexual harassment policy, we're also looking at related policies, which, for example, the disciplinary policies, the whistleblowing policies, and other linked policies so that we can try to ensure we've got an environment in which people feel safe uh, to speak. The next area is raising awareness and increasing uh, communication channels and making sure that staff know where to go. We have put out a new uh, information uh, note, which makes it very clear uh, where the different channels that staff can use to report, and there are many of them. Uh, we have also instituted in the last month a 24-hour Secretariat helpline. So this helpline is, as I said, 24 hours. Uh, seven, where anybody can call and will get not a machine, but a person, um, a person who has been trained to answer and to be able to give confidential uh, support or to um, direct the person to a place um, where they should actually report a complaint. So there, it's to get information, it's to report complaints, it's to get support, and then it is linked to other services, such as counselling, such as investigations. We've updated a mandatory training program that we have, 
on sexual harassment, we did have a program for quite a while. It wasn't, it, it was supposedly mandatory, but it really wasn't being um, implemented in a mandatory way. So we have updated it and we will be ensuring that everybody uh, follows it. Uh, we also uh, realized that people have, have, have not felt that they could, they could uh, Okay, that they could speak out as much as we would want. So we are uh, having a survey to listen to staff to understand what is it that we can do better, what is it that you actually need. And then the other part of it is investigation, because investigations have been rather slow. So what we are doing now, we have now mandated our independent office of uh, OIOS to investigate all complaints related to sexual harassment and implement a streamlined fast track procedure. We are increasing the number of investigators. We are ensuring that these investigators are going to be specialized and we are going to increase the number of women. Can I have one more minute? Then I'll just use my last minute to say that at the system-wide level, at the Chief Executive's Board uh, last November, Secretary General established a system-wide task force. This is senior most uh, managers throughout the, all the organizations of the system, and we are trying to bring a harmonization of policies. Doesn't mean they all have to be the same, but best practices shared uh, right across uh, the system. We are looking to see how we can improve investigative capacity, how we can share all those best practices. We're putting in place guidelines for managers, again, toned from the top, it's very mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. And we're looking to see how all the different parts of the system can work together, where, whether it's human resources, it's counseling, it's ethics, it's ombudsman, uh, it's investigation, so that everyone can work together in partnership. That would be my last word, because if we don't have partnership, if we don't have partnership with member states, non-governmental organizations, the civil society, the press, academia, and others, we won't conquer this. It's all about culture change. We need to do it together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Under Secretary General, for that thorough overview, both of what's happening within the Secretariat, but system-wide. Uh, if I could now turn to you, Ambassador. Uh, Kenya, of course, was a co-sponsor of the resolution that Ambassador Dannon mentioned, um, so we'd be most interested in your views. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> moderator. Um, Ambassador Dannon, um, USG uh, Bigo, I am not sure I can pronounce this, but let me try. Or <laughs> Suli Zenu, is that the way? That's okay. Okay, well, close, okay. Um, and uh, Madam Sandler, uh, dear colleagues, <clears throat> um, ladies and gentlemen, please first allow me to express my gratitude to the IPI and Mr. Moderator, uh, in collaboration with the permanent missions of Israel, Colombia, and my own, for organizing this very important uh, meeting. I also want to thank um, all of you for finding time. This is to be here with us because uh, this is really emerging as a, a very serious problem. Uh, for us here at the United Nations. And it is important to see so many of you showing interest and, and being here this afternoon. Uh, sexual harassment is not new at the UN. As you know, there has been a lot of discussion around sexual harassment in field operations, peacekeeping operations, and so on. And there has been also a lot of uh, discussions around the issue even here at the at the Secretariat. In fact, we have had muted discussions about its pre prevalence within the Secretariat itself. Even some member states have been accused of uh, sexual harassment. So um, we also, as, uh, as previous speakers have mentioned, we have had uh, been reading in the news about funds and programs which have been directly affected Recently, uh, we are aware of the complaints of sexual abuse even against the, the, the New York Office of International Civil Service Commission, the ICSC, uh, that uh, in the system which, you know, no one in the system seems to, to want to actually address it because the Office of SG, uh, the Office of the PGA, 
they are not mandated to address this issue of accountability. Although the IOS, the IOIS is investigating this issue, it is important and uh, that we have a structured way of addressing sexual harassment within the, the United Nations. Last year, when Israel introduced the resolution on preventing and eliminating sexual harassment in workplace, we received bold instructions to sponsor and support this resolution, speaking to an issue that is very, very important to Kenya. Therefore, co-hosting co this event is a natural progression in the process of combating sexual harassment at the UN. And in fact, member states need to play a much more critical role. Sexual harassment is often, often occurs in situations of asymmetrical power dynamics where the perpetrators have the dominant positions compared to victims. There isn't actually, um, how do you say, a, a, a universal, a, a broad understanding common understanding of sexual harassment, and that's actually the start of the problem. Once we have a broad understanding and a constituency of people who know what it means and what it entails, perhaps we can begin to address it all together. Um, it is one of the key pervasive and dehumanizing acts that is hardly clearly understood and openly acknowledged. In some instances, regrettably, it is more often viewed as normal, especially when the victims do not speak up for fear of reprisals as their violators are people with power over them. So it is difficult to report in some cases in work setups because the perpetrators are often the people from where redress should be sought. Generally, institutions and organizations are by law required to adopt and institute sexual harassment policies, craft guidelines to implement these policies and designate committees or bodies to receive and investigate complaints and punish or recommend prosecution for sexual harassment. However, as we know, many institutions do not even have these policies and where they have them, they most likely lack implementing guidelines. So sexual harassment at the workplace is not limited to powerful men and subordinate women only, but it also includes in some cases powerful women and, in, and subordinate men. It's a, it takes a huge toll on, on the people who suffer from it, have uh, different uh, ways of manifesting uh, sexual harassment, through stress, anxiety, fear, hopelessness, helplessness, and even loss of self-esteem and self-worth. Where there's sexual exploitation, it can fracture families and destroy relationships. The behavior starts from young age, for example, where a boy or a girl touches you inappropriately is usually excused, but it's even though it's still humiliating and it, it hurts. Many women are aware that uh, you have experienced one way or the other whistles or cut calls from men and boys when you are passing by. And, and you know, this is in some cases viewed as admiration. We all know about club and locker room banter where men and boys discuss girls and women using disrespectful and humiliating language. This behavior unfortunately finds its space in all spheres of our lives, including the workplace, the gym, transport system, and other areas. So I want to share with you uh, very briefly uh, the Kenyan perspectives of uh, sexual harassment. So sexual harassment in workplace in Kenya is defined and prohibited by law. For example, the Kenya Employment Act requires all employee, employers of both public and private engaging more than 20 employees after consulting them to issue a policy statement on sexual harassment. It, the, the law uh, provides that an employee is sexually, it actually defines it and says, an employee is sexually harassed if he or she, um, her employer or co-worker, directly or indirectly requests that that employee for sexual intercourse, sexual contact, or any other form of sexual activity that contains an implied or express one promise for preferential treatment in employment, two, threat of detrimental treatment in employment, and three, 
threat about the present or future employment status of the employee, uh, or uses language, whether written or spoken, that is of sexual uh, nature. And uh, I see threats coming on from this direction, so I better run quickly. But essentially, uh, we have legislation and policies in Kenya that define and punish. And what is actually interesting is that all the institutions that have, um, there is law that requires specific minimum content to the sexual harassment policy and legislation that should be adopted and implemented by institutions. And we have seen high court cases in which uh, individuals or employees have taken uh, their organizations to court and, and gotten redress because their organization's uh, sexual policy, uh, uh, sexual harassment policy does not, is not comprehensive enough. And we have very um, progressive cases, but of course it remains a challenge because uh, there are a number of issues. Uh, I have one minute to go, but there, is a, there are a number of issues that require to be done by all of us. One of them is um, how to address this uh, multidimensional um, issue. For example, <clears throat> uh, sexual harassment requires that we have societal change of attitudes. Um, we need to encourage or to have support mechanisms that encourage people, to victims, to, to speak up. In, in addition, here at the UN, uh, member states of the UN working with uh, international labor organization need to formulate some form of uh, global or universally uh, understood and accepted standard code of conduct or, or policy framework on sexual harassment that member states can adopt and use as a universal criteria for addressing sexual harassment. I, I thank you for your attention and welcome any questions that you may have that I, I don't get a threat from my moderator <laughs> to respond to, but thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. <laughs> Ms. Sulitzano, uh, from your vantage point, uh, what, uh, if, if you could share your, your thoughts, we'd, we'd be welcome. Thank okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I, oh. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm excited to be here today to share with you some of the knowledge, expertise, and best practices developed in Israel in order to combat sexual harassment in the workplace. For me, as a practitioner, it is obvious that this is a time of revolution. This revolution started as a grassroots uprising when women in many places in the world and in Israel have said, enough is enough, time's up. We're not sexual objects and we refuse to be treated as such. We all know that so many women have suffered from sexual harassment in the workplace. And this is unbearable. Women have become used to accepting, uh, to accepting chauvinist, demeaning, and humiliating behavior regarding the way they look, the way they talk, and the way they dress. It is illogical and immoral. Let me start by briefly describing some of the unique characteristics of the Israeli society, which are very relevant to the issue of sexual harassment. Israeli society is multicultural. It is a fabric of different religious, religions, ethnicities, minorities, veteran Israelis and immigrants, religious and secular. Each group has its culture and set of values, which naturally has to do also with perceptions regarding gender relations, power structure, and sexuality. It is also a society in transition in which large sectors are traditional, conservative, and hold anachronistic perceptions. At the same time, it is also a very liberal and progressive society, innovative and resourceful, with a vibrant and developed non-governmental sector. Israel is known as a startup nation a country at the cutting edge of technology and development, of creation and problem solving. Well, that isn't just relegated to one sector. We are a country with, with the same problems as, uh, uh, that are found in other places in the world. 
but we are also a country whose people are committed to finding solutions to the most pressing challenges. Looking at the history of sexual harassment in Israel, we, had, we identify a number of landmarks. The first one uh, took, tw uh, took place 20 years ago when a groundbreaking law was legislated, the Prevention of Sexual Harassment Law, which defines sexual harassment and has laid the legal mechanism for both prevention and prosecution of offenders. This law recognized the fact that sexual harassment at the workplace is a common phenomenon and has severe implications. This law provides victims three, three channels of action. The first one is filing a complaint at the police. The second is filing a civil suit. And the third one is filing a complaint within the workplace. Another historic landmark was the prosecution and conviction of Israel's former president, Moshe Katsav, who was charged with multiple cases of rape and sexual assault, and in the year 2011 was sentenced to seven years in jail. This event has played a huge role in raising awareness and creating a momentum of Israeli women from different sectors who were encouraged to confront their traumas, tell their stories, and seek justice. This momentum was strong and wide. It included the political arena, academia, army, show business, the health sector, and more. And another important landmark took place between 2013 to 2015, in which one third of the senior command of the Israeli police was forced out after being accused of sexual harassment and behavior not fit for service. So in short, Long before the worldwide Me Too campaign broke out, Israeli society was already engaged in activism against sexual harassment. Let me say a few words about sexual harassment and its grave implications on both the individual and organizational level. On the individual level, sexual harassment badly affects the, the mental well-being and sometimes the physical health of the victims and in many cases, their families as well. On the organizational level, sexual harassment creates a sense of unsecure environment and harm the morale. It decreases productivity, creates fin financial loss, and badly damages the image of the organization. Therefore, the need to eradicate this phenomenon is clear. A systematic, a systematic effort to prevent sexual harassment by adopting a victim-based approach will be effective and beneficial. The growing awareness to the fact that sexual harassment is absolutely everywhere has created a unique opportunity for us at the Association of Rape Crisis Centers in Israel to introduce practical tools which, which help organizations to combat sexual harassment in a methodological and effective way. This tool is called the Voluntary Code for Prevention of Sexual Harassment in the Workplace. The code, which we developed in collaboration with the Israeli Standards Institute with governmental and philanthropic funding, encourages organizations to implement the, the following steps. The first, uh, the, preliminary the preliminary stage is analyzing and understanding the special structural features of that organization and how sexual harassment happens with re uh, within repeatedly. It needs to be clear, sexual harassment happens many times because certain situation and practices of the organization enable, enable it to more easily happen. What are the characteristics that allow for such crimes to co be committed? What unique factors contribute to an organization's vulnerability? Such st structural features include significant age gaps between senior male employees and their female subordinates, night shifts and irregular working hours, out of office work and travel, physical contact such in medical treatment and in sports, multicultural, multilinguistic organizations in which there are frictions and misunderstandings between co-workers with regards to norms and values. We developed a unique sexual harassment organizational analysis with, with a sociologist, sociologist from Tel Aviv University, Dr. Lehrer, 
This analysis includes building a catalog of situations and a typology of offenders, all based on the information we collected from the field. This is how we developed a deep understanding of the hazard zones in the specific organization. The next stage is tailoring a set of practices and regulations specifically aimed to disrupt and minimize cases of sexual harassment in the specific organization. We call it our iRobot, this kind of method. After we introduce the new procedures to the management and the staff, including training and implementation. An ultra important component has to, has, has to do with monitoring and supervision in order to make sure that the new policies are properly, properly implemented, there is a need to periodically visit the organization and to do a, a routine check. This monitoring role takes place by employees of the Israel Standards Institute. Every two years, the Standards Institute inspects participating organizations using a comprehensive set of markers we developed together. This ensures the, the sustainability of the project. It is important to emphasize that, vo that the voluntary code is based on the Israeli law, but what, but what it does is bring operative, practical measures of implementation of the law. Most importantly, every country has the opportunity to adopt the same mechanism and develop a voluntary code of its own. Despite the fact that it is not compulsory it is not a compulsory obligation. More and more organizations, including local municipalities, health organizations, high-tech companies, have decided to adopt and implement it. Yes, it is good for public relations, but the real value of this groundbreaking methodology is that it makes our organizations, corporates, and workplaces safer, better, more productive, and, and respectful environments. We need to remember the world is changing. Women and girls, as well as boys and men, are not willing to accept any longer an abusive environment. Let me conclude by saying that sexual harassment in the workplace is an acute social problem, but not an, in an uh, incurable disease. It takes no more than leadership and will. If there is will and true, pure intent, it is possible to rid organizations and workplaces of sexual harassment. Thanks so much. I think the, the two previous interventions, in a way, are a very useful way of understanding how different member states and civil society organizations in those states have addressed the challenge of, of sexual harassment in the workplace and, and elsewhere, and potentially provide a very useful example, both in terms of legal framework, but also practical policy tools as the UN uh, focuses on this issue now that it is very much in the public eye. And I think it's a great segue uh, Joanne, to your presentation, uh, and you know, if you could share your thoughts on what you see as the way forward, particularly given the, the length of time that, that you've spent engaging on this issue, please. Thank you, Jake. Thank you so much, and thanks. Big gratitude to IPI and the sponsoring organizations of this event. We need more and more of these spaces, and thanks to all of you who have come. Those of you who are standing in the back, there are some chairs up here just in case you're tired of standing. Um, I, I wanted to start by just saying that on the way over, my mother, who's 88, called me. And she said, you know, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to make a speech about sexual harassment. And she said, sexual harassment? Everybody's against that. What are you going to say? <laughs> so I, was, I wanted to say, Mom, this is what I'm going to say. Um, if there is a golden rule about ending and preventing sexual harassment and abuse in organizations, or communities or countries. It is about listening to those who have experienced it. Because as all panelists have said, sexual harassment is not just about sex, it's about abuse of power. And that's why I wanted to weave the stories of women who have experienced sexual harassment and assault in the UN into my seven minutes. I wanted to show you this book, it's called Working with Sharks, Countering Sexual Harassment in Our Lives. And it's a riveting and detailed account of sexual harassment 
years ago in the UN office in Pakistan. Um, and in case the UN doesn't have it, I'm happy to share this because there's a huge amount to learn. Um, but I'm going to focus on the case of Catherine Claxton. With my colleague Julie Thompson, who's here today, we've been documenting this case um, so that it becomes a, a learning case. Uh, it took place in the early 1990s, long before Me Too. Catherine Claxton was a G7 administrative staff who stood up to a man who became an undersecretary general, Maria Luis Gomez. And after more than four years of her tenacity, he was found guilty and dismissed. It made front page headlines at the time, and yet it is often forgotten as an important moment in the UN's history and an experience we can learn from. How many people in this room have ever heard of the Catherine Claxton case? Any? Very few. Most UN staff that I know don't know about it. And I didn't know that much about it when I worked at the UN, so it's taken a lot of research. Um, many things have changed since that time, and too many things have stayed the same. So here are four things about that case that I think remain instructive today. So first, Catherine Claxton confronted a wall of power and intimidation, and much of it was about protecting the system and protecting this competent man. The Secretary General and almost every other high-level official lined up in support of him from the very beginning. You might remember that Madeleine Albright famously said, there's a special place in hell for women who don't support other women. <laughs> Madeleine Albright was the UN ambassador at the time. And when the lawyers for Claxton went to the US mission for support, because she was a US citizen, she, they were told by Madeleine Albright's staff, don't touch him. He's good. We like him. Right? And so that's what happens. So what does that tell us about today? If the UN creates a top-down process to produce rules and practices on sexual harassment that are rooted first in protecting the organization rather than the staff, it sends a clear message and reinforces power inequalities. Putting lawyers and human resource people at the forefront of developing policies and resources for survivors and failing to consult with the women and men who are survivors and who have the stories to tell, signals that this is more about the organization's liability than it is about staff. So if those who have experienced harassment, including national staff, younger staff, consultants, those who are most vulnerable, are not at the table in constructing the UN's response, how effective could it possibly be? Second, in the Claxton case, a turning point was the Secretary General's decision to call in an outside arbiter. Uh, Butros Butros Ghali was, was the SG, and he brought in the only woman on the Irish Supreme Court to conduct a 16-day hearing and issue a verdict. Luckily, the judge's name was Mella Carroll, and she knew something about sexual harassment and ultimately found uh, Gomez guilty. Gomez had Alan, famous lawyer Alan Dershowitz as his defense counsel. The Catherine had two pro bono human rights lawyers, uh, Mary Dorman and Ellie Narashevsky, who were amazing lawyers. But there was definitely a, a power inequity. Um, all the internal justice processes that Catherine tried failed her or were stopped. So what does that tell us about today? The UN and many other institutions, from universities to religious institutions, have systematically failed to deliver open, transparent justice processes. Internal investigations and adjudications don't work. There is no shortage of expertise in sexual harassment around the world, and the UN should pull in outside experts to investigate and adjudicate cases. Third, the pressure on Claxton to withdraw her case was intense. High-level women in the UN system signed and circulated a letter in support of him. She was shot at. Her apartment was broken into. Even after the judge issued a guilty verdict, the Secretary General's office tried to suppress the report. The list goes on and on, and yet she persisted. The fact that she was a US citizen made it possible for her to persevere. So again, what does that tell us about today? My third point is that all policies and practice must be based on an analysis of how gender and intersectional discrimination works. Vulnerable staff in the UN, whether they are women staff, national staff, staff that are dependent on visas, staff um, that represent different gender identities, staff on insecure contracts, all have reasons not to report because they are so vulnerable. 
staff were pressured by managers to support perpetrators. When I was the deputy executive director of UNIFEM, I received numerous calls from staff who were being pressured by resident coordinators or senior managers to speak out in support of perpetrators and against victims. So if this is happening, the UN then needs to address all of the reasons that different staff are reluctant to support, to report, and make some provision for anonymous and third party reporting. Fourth, it was, it was the support of a small group of women within the UN who made it possible for Catherine to be heard. As in many other sexual assault cases and harassment cases, it was an inside person who leaked the story to the press, and that's what ultimately put pressure on the system to release the report. What does that tell us about today? Staff do not want to leak to the press. They only do it when they can't find any recourse internally. So we need to encourage and create and incentivize support systems for victims. The SG needs to use spaces like the Interagency Committee on Women and Gender Equality, like the UN Commission on the, on the Status of Women, for him and his senior staff to listen to the voices of women. He could organize a global video conference, as we did in 1999, to listen to the experiences of staff and communities. And the UN could use its vast network of gender experts within and outside to really examine and disrupt um, gender power relations that are not good for the system or the individuals. So what happened with Catherine Claxton could have been a wake up call and instead it was a system failure. Not only did the system fail to reform, in many ways the system learned to protect perpetrators better. So I've already highlighted some priorities for the future. Listen to the voices of those who experience harassment ensure that there is outside impartial adjudication, take an intersectional and gender approach, and guarantee confidentiality, support the most vulnerable, and incentivize that support. There are just two more points I want to make. First, those who are working to change the current situation need to remember, and it echoes uh, Jan Beagle's point, organizational Culture eats organizational strategy for breakfast. Mm -hmm. Sexual harassment is not about a few bad, it's not about a few bad apples. It's about a system and it's about abuse of power. Without tackling the deep structures that hold gender inequality in place, sexual harassment will just find other spaces and forms to take place. And finally, as a UN staff member and someone who believes deeply in the multilateral system. I'd like to see the UN system become the site of leadership and learning on how to prevent, eliminate, and respond effectively to sexual harassment. We'd like to see a comprehensive zero tolerance policy. Sexual harassment, and many people have used a disease um, metaphor, it's the flu that the UN keeps getting because it has a weak immune system. We need to strengthen the immune system. But unlike the flu, there is no vaccine for gender inequality, and there is no recipe for dealing with sexual harassment. There are no winners in sexual harassment cases, no matter what the verdict. But there are a lot of organizations like my own who would love to help the UN to respond to this in a really thoughtful, strategic, and sustainable way. Um, because of courageous women like Catherine, like the women in the UN office in Pakistan, like the women in the A2 movement who are now speaking out, we are all embarking on a steep learning curve. The UN could become, and we hope it does, the preeminent global institution in dealing with sexual harassment and abuse. If it listens to those who have brought cases, to those who were too intimidated to bring cases, and to those who stood by silently. And I wanna end with, a, a, a phrase that you all know, that those who do not learn their history are doomed to repeat it. So this is the moment where we have to counter that, learn our history, and move forward on what we know. Thank you. Joanne, <clears throat> Joanne thanks so much. It was an incredibly rousing call to action, and I think a way, uh, in a way, a, a great way to now turn to the audience. Uh, we have uh, a little over half an hour for questions and, and, and comments. 
and recalling what I said at the beginning that today is very much meant to be the start of a discussion between the UN, between member states and, and civil society. I hope we make good use of the, of the time. So if you would like to speak, uh, I, would call, I will call on you. I would ask that you please keep your remarks and your questions brief, and if you could also please introduce yourselves. So the floor is open. Uh, in the back, please. Hi, uh, Ellen Flax, the Hadassah Foundation. So a question for Arit. Oh, sorry, uh, Ellen Flax, uh, director of the Hadassah Foundation. Question for Arit, who I'm very proud to say that we're one of their funders. So can you talk a little bit about um, uh, any efforts, uh, especially since Israel has been working with Kenya, about how to potentially bring the, the code and the actual process that you guys are doing in Israel to the UN? That's a good idea. Can I, can <laughs> I, before you, yeah, let me take a let me take a few if there if there are any other comments, and if not, certainly we'll uh, here and and then behind. Thanks, Jake. Uh, Wasim Mir from the United Nations Foundation. First, thanks to IPI for organizing uh, this event and getting such a good panel together. And congratulations to Kenya, Israel, and others for getting that great resolution through CSW. So well done for that. I think it's a great uh, achievement. So I spent four years as a delegate to the United Nations, and most of the harassment and inappropriate behavior I witnessed was, was between member state delegates and other uh, member state delegates and other member state delegates, and actually more commonly between member state delegates and members of the Secretariat. And this seems to me that, that that's a kind of lacuna. We spend a lot of time talking about what the Secretariat can do to, uh, to solve the issue within the United Nations. But I'm wonder, I'd welcome thoughts from the panel about what we can do to use this kind of Me Too moment, this never again moment, uh, moment to try and tackle the issue between uh, between member states and between member states towards the Secretariat. Thanks, Vasya. Uh, and please, in the, just there. Hello, my name is Jade Cochran. I work at UN Women, and I am in a new team that's just been established by the UN Women Executive Director about a week and a half ago. She's just appointed Puna Sen, who was previously the Director of Policy, to be the new Executive Coordinator and Spokesperson on Sexual Harassment and Related Discrimination. So one, just bringing that to everyone's attention. And Joanne, I thought your, I thought all of the presentations were excellent, and Joanne, I thought you had some great recommendations, which I look forward to drawing upon, and I thought um, some of the things that you suggested about taking a victim-centered approach, listening to the women who have gone through this, ensuring a gender analysis and intersectional approach, these are things that I know Porna is keen to take on. And it was, un um, sorry uh, that um, USD Beagle had to leave the room at the point of, of Joanne's presentation, but I'm sure there are things that the CEB task force are doing that are linked to those. Um, so I think it would be a good opportunity for us to respond and say how we're doing some of those things. Uh, Hi, colleagues. Uh, Niall McCann is my name from UN Development Programme. I think these comments are directed to, to Jan in particular. It's more of a plea, I think. Uh, this morning, our, our administrator issued a new uh, code of conduct or, or a, a new policy around standards of behaviour, which was sent at 11 a.m. this morning, and it links to the UNDP policy on abuse of authority and harassment in the workplace. That document speaks about uh, an informal process to resolve sexual harassment cases and a formal process. The informal process involves a two-step procedure where, first of all, incredibly, the, the offended party is uh, encouraged to approach the person abusing them and seek uh, an informal resolution, which kind of sounds like UNDP telling the person, we don't want to hear about it, try and fix it yourself. Secondly, if there is, uh, the second part of the informal process uh, is a mediation phase conducted by the office of the ombudsperson. A, a female colleague of mine is currently going through a rather difficult, clear case of sexual harassment where there is written, documented evidence. And the ombudsperson's office has recommended an informal mediation as if it's couples therapy is required. Um, to resolve that, that situation. If the staff member, however, or non-staff member feels they don't want to deal with the informal process, they can go straight to the formal process. The formal process is a three-step process 
whereby the director of investigations, after receiving and reviewing, reviewing all of the evidence, the director will complete a review and decide if the matter warrants an assessment. Now, during the assessment, which is a different process, it's one that is conducted after the review, the assessment will clarify the allegations, ensure that this is in fact workplace harassment, make sure that all the evidence is submitted, and incredibly consider the possibility of informal resolution. If, however, after one month of the preliminary assessment, one month after that period of time, the director, if he finds that there are reasons to believe that the complaint is founded, he or she will launch an investigation. <laughs> so we have a review, an assessment, and an investigation. The message that this sends to staff that are being abused and harassed and who want to come forward is incredible. There should be one way and one way only to deal with matters related to, to harassment. There should be one hotline, one procedure, one system. But by having five separate procedures in this document, I think the message that it sends out to staff is clear. Thank you. Before we take another round, let me, let me come back to the panel for initial responses. Uh, Comments, outrage, if warranted. <laughs> okay. Whomever, yes. I can start. Okay. First, I want to uh, answer Rabbi Ellen Fax from the Hadassah Foundation that indeed, for the fa for uh, last years, has uh, continued to help us uh, implement this code in Israel, and uh, and it, the, her question exactly. Uh, talks with the question you just presented, with what you presented right now, that if I was impolite, I would just put my hands over my ears, because uh, what you stated right now is, uh, I'm sorry to say, it, uh, it reveals a misunderstanding of how to deal with sexual harassment in the workplace. And uh, a victim-based victim, uh, victim approach is number one. Without doing uh, work uh, from a victim-based uh, victim approach, nothing will be done. Uh, you can put tons of um, bureaucracy in organizations. Bureaucracies do not solve problems. So I think the UN indeed could uh, uh, learn from our voluntary code and adopt it to its, uh, its policies. It's not so complicated. It has a unique, uh, it has very detailed uh, uh, practices which could be matched to the structure of this organization and maybe even uh, uh, I have some kind of organization do uh, uh, some uh, some uh, checkups one year, two years, because uh, the the problem is sustainability. Now, as I understand, there's a leader who says zero tolerance to the situation, zero tolerance to sexual harassment. This this is a very uh, this time is very very important. And if you have such a good leader in in this aspect, it's good to, to implement something that will stay afterwards because sustainability in dealing with sexual harassment sometimes is a problem. There are a lot of uh, regulations, a lot of processes, and many times they're not implemented. So I really suggest to the UN to learn from high-tech nation <laughs> and uh, take our code and uh, make it uh, suitable to this organization. Thanks, Jan? Yeah. Jan? Yeah. Jan? Yeah. Yes. I'm very sorry that I had to leave Joanne. But it's, uh, Another crisis, uh, <laughs> but um, what I what I would would like to say is, is that um, first of all, at, at the level of the system, uh, we have a, a task force which is really senior people, and I'm really pleased we'll have a good senior person now from UN Women as well. And this is something which I think is showing a real change in organisations. We are now getting senior people appointed to deal with this subject in organizations, and that is very important. So the Secretary General has appointed me to chair this task force, and one of the things we're looking at is best practices of policy. So it's a pity that we haven't actually waited a minute until we finish this work, which will be very soon, uh, before new policies are issued, but I think we can review that. It's a matter of learning, and it's a matter of trying to see that we do get the best practice. Uh, that said, I think that uh, best practice does show that there are different ways of addressing this issue, that there may be cases that should, if we are coming from a victim-centered approach, um, we should be having the 
persons to decide how they want to deal with that, but clearly in a way that is supportive to them. Uh, the other thing I would like to say in terms of what was raised by Wasim is actually I was in a, a meeting in a uh, mission um, just uh, maybe a week or so ago, uh, I won't say which one, but there was a Secretary of State there, and uh, we actually were discussing this issue, and I said that it is actually, um, there are points of vulnerability. So one of them you might think, uh, and is actually, um, in field missions that are isolated, where we have young people with, you know, a big imbalance of, of power and not much gender parity in that mission. But another place of vulnerability is right here uh, in New York uh, in some of the uh, delegate areas with our young interns and others, a very serious area of vulnerability. So we need to be looking at all of these issues, and that's why I said at the beginning, it has to be a partnership amongst all of us to drive this change. Thank you. Oh. No, sir. Okay, especially because you have such wonderful information to share, which I, I hope you can be able to share with us so that we don't forget history. But I just want to start by saying that um, the, 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 I agree with uh, the USG, but I would like to say that the UN um, bureaucracy is just too complicated. The procedures that we are hearing about it takes forever for the for, for for these issues of sexual harassment to be addressed, and this is in fact where the real meaning of justice delayed is justice denied because there is no other place I have been like where the bureaucracy is counterproductive to the to 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 the length that it sabotages the very institutions that are put in place to help sit, to help the member states and also the staff uh, gain some redress i think that we must have not just the policies we must have the guidelines we must have institutions and it is a good thing that we have these desks and senior of officials that are you know have been engaged by different agencies but we need to step back take a breath because the issue of sexual harassment is so pervasive, it needs to be addressed conclusively and comprehensively. So we, we don't need to have these knee-jerk responses. Because at the end of the day, UNDP has something, UNICEF has something, U, UN Women has something, and so on, all this organization. And then we go back to working in silos. And this is a problem. Because at the end of the day, the UN Secretariat is holding um, an octopus with very many, you know, I don't know what you call them, this tentacles, and it is not really addressing the problem. So it is indeed true that there is a big problem that needs to be addressed here, even between member states, as you have mentioned. Member states, uh, some delegates are harassing interns and UN staff. It's not, it's not a secret. It is something that is in the open. But we are so ashamed and, and, and sort of it doesn't affect me, so I don't do anything about it and keep quiet. It is time that we have to put it in, in the open. We all need to understand what sexual harassment means. A lot of people think it's, it's admiration, it's, it's, it's normal. And in a lot of communities, even well, we come from uh, sexual harassment is is a concept that exists it's but it's not really properly understood so if we have a common understanding what it is and 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 sort of criminalize it the UN and member states need to be fined and and to the victims need to be compensated so that there is a feeling that you 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 lose something when you this, when you perpetuate this. And, and I get very passionate about this because I spend a lot of my life, my other life, working around women's movement and issues like this. And that is why in Kenya in 2006, we fought so hard to have legislation that is called Sexual Offenses Act. And it is only on all offenses related to uh, to, to, to sexuality and, and, and sex, and it is important that we recognize the same here at the UN and, and call out, if necessary, perpetrators. Yeah. So thank you. I, I would just add, I'm, thank you for those questions. 
So, oh, sorry. Thank you for those questions because they reminded me of three things I really wanted to say. And one, in relation to your point from UN Foundation, is um, the notion that sexual harassment is happening more between delegates and with uh, staff and delegates. And I think one of the real challenges, we don't know enough about what actually is happening because the data is so bad, right? If people are af afraid to report, if most people get advice, and they do, to just keep it quiet and move on, because that's what happens in the system, then we actually have no idea what the level of sexual harassment is. And I think what we've seen in the Me Too movement it is that it's far greater than anybody was willing to accept. So one of the hopes we have, I think, for the new policy is that there is a much more serious engagement with how you collect data, how you preserve anonymity, how we get a much better handle on how many cases, et cetera. Some of the, I remember when uh, I was hired actually in 1994 to train the Sexual Harassment Grievance Panel for UNDP. And the head of human resources at that time said, well, we must be doing a good job because we've only had two cases reported, right? And I think many human resources people say that. We must be doing a good job. We're not getting any reports. Actually, that means you're doing a horrible job, <laughs> right? If you're not getting reports, there is something wrong in the system. So I think your question is really important. Um, the UNDP example, which is heartbreaking, um, makes one think, again, you know, there is I don't think there's any ideal policy in the world, um, but there are such so many good practices from organizations around the world. Um, you, you name some, there are many others. How are the policies within the UN being formulated? Are, is the UN reaching out to the significant knowledge trust there is in the world about this and bringing best practice in? Because it doesn't sound like that. And so that, I think, is another really important thing. The other thing is that it is very difficult for staff to stand up and say, we won't accept this kind of policy. We need a better policy. But I think it's, it's so crucial that you are raising that. Um, and lastly, and just to say to the Undersecretary General, as we were talking about this, that you know, it is so important to have the voices of those who have gone through this, who have experienced sexual harassment, who have, who have been afraid to bring their cases. And so what I would ask is in those groups that are formulating policy and practice, are there people who have, you know, are there secretaries, are there national staff, are there those who are most vulnerable? Because if they're not there, and if it's just a top-down process, then the policies and the practices won't work. So hopefully, there will be that level of inclusion. Thanks. Thank you. All right, I think we have time for a few more questions. Um, so let me go to Hillary, and then yeah. Thank you. Um, as you guys know, we're streaming this live on Facebook. And so we have a question from Ayelet Razine in Tel Aviv. And he wants to know, is there a mechanism to deal with anonymous complaints? I'm Dr. Daniele of uh, the International Organization for Victim Assistance and uh, the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies. So I want to reflect a little bit on the perspective from the field of trauma, on what you're talking about. In the field of trauma, and actually I prepared my first book out of six for the UN about how the UN deals with traumas or not, should deal with trauma or not, etc. So it's been around. I did it for Butrus Gali at the time. Um, a victim of trauma, uh, what we know is that the trauma itself is never the end. It's the conspiracy of silence after the trauma that actually not only wounds the victim, but almost stamps the wound. What we are talking about is the United Nations as a system, as an organization, with a bureaucracy, with 
a culture of abuse of power. Sorry. Uh, we are talking about cultures of abuse of power. And let's call it what it is. Uh, how all of that uh, almost purposefully, not almost, purposefully creates a conspiracy of silence against the individual victim. It happens to be a woman, but it also is men by men by women. We know that this is, exists among peacekeepers, not only within the peacekeeping quotes family, and we abuse that word too, the international community, family. Abusers call it the family too, to, to sort of say, I actually love you, so please, don't you love me too, so don't complain about me. What, do you want to destroy me, my career, my family? Uh, also, as a psychologist, I've treated cases, actually, of sexual abuse from, within the UN system. Uh, so the silos work as walls of silence. Well, it, if you do it horizontally or vertically. Um, I wasn't going to speak today, but because <laughs> I knew the case very well that you talked about. Uh, somehow the UN hasn't learned that protecting its own image is actually the least important part. I understand the impulse to do that, of course. But that's really not the case. And it ends up being a traumatizing force in the lives of its staff, its people. Of course, there's the whole other story of the diplomats. Many come alone. People are lonely. Many people who serve the UN are lonely. And they seek company. And they don't mean to abuse their power. But somehow it ends up that way. So there's a lot, there's a lot more to tell than to just resort to policies and practices and best policies and best practices. Because if the system doesn't want these best policies and practices, they, it doesn't matter that they exist on paper. Sorry, I do feel more passionate about this still than I thought I do. Great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks very much. All right. Seeing no other hands, um, why don't we come back to the panel, Under Secretary General. Yeah, thank you. I think I said at the very outset that in the UN, we are absolutely um, convinced that this issue is much, much larger than we know, is significantly underreported, and is clearly not being dealt with in the way that it should be. So that, please let me make that very clear. We are not in any way trying to, to protect any image. We are trying to say that we, with every other sector in society, has to grapple with this problem. And as I said at the beginning, this problem has been there probably from time immemorial, but it has recently, and, and luckily I would say, um, got a lot more prominence. And I do believe that we are trying to deal with it now in a very forthright manner. This task force that I told you about, bringing together senior people from across the whole system, so really to get away from the silos, was only put together in November, we'll be reporting by May. We are trying to make it very inclusive because it's clear we've got to listen. This breaking of the silence is absolutely key. It's also clear that our data is very incomplete and that's another reason why we're looking into all different ways to improve our data, not only so that we can devise proper solutions on the basis of data, but also that we can have a more transparent um, process across the system so that, that if we do have people who have had substantiated cases against them, we don't move these people around in the system, whether they're UN staff or whether they're our partners. Uh, the other thing I might say to, to those member state representatives who are here is that this is, there is also um, an urgent need for us to strengthen our investigative capacities. Uh, we need more people who are specialized in this kind of investigation. We need more women investigators. This involves, of course, uh, resources 
So we will be asking for more. We already got papers out asking for more. So I hope that you will um, look at that in a uh, positive uh, manner. But the last thing uh, I would say is that this type of meeting is absolutely essential. The more that we can learn from the past, the more that we can learn from when things have not been well done, and also the more that we can share the good practices, uh, the better and the stronger our policy framework and our actions, because that's really what matters, our actions will be as we go forward. So I just want to thank the organisers for inviting us here today. Uh, I want to thank the, the panel and I want to say that as far as I'm concerned, it's a, it's a process of really continuous learning with this, but also action and action as fast as we possibly can. Thank you very much. Thanks, Under Secretary General. Ambassador. <clears throat> thank you very much and thank you for your questions again. What is emerging from this conversation is clear. It's a clear call for action that we need more fora for this discussion, for this kind of discussions. We perhaps need, we have a lot of group of friends in, in the UN among member states. Perhaps we need one more group of friends on combating sexual harassment and other kind of fora to discuss this to destigmatize sexual harassment, to make it something that we can acknowledge without shame, without embarrassment, and to make it wrong, really. We need that. And finally, and, and I agree with you, USG, that we need a proper infrastructure at the UN to deal comprehensively with these sexual harassment issues. And, and that includes data, collection of data, it includes encouraging, and even if it requires rewarding victims to report these cases, because without encouraging and providing support mechanisms to victims to, to report, then they, they will not do that. And it, we also need uh, awareness creation to, to, to make a lot of victims know that what is being done to them is actually wrong because some people don't actually know that and it is important that we have a, a, a framework that provides a support mechanism for everyone that punishes perpetrators to end impunity. Thank you. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks very much, Ambassador Ori. Thank you. From our experience, uh, we, we get uh, telephone calls from a lot of uh, sexual harassment survivors. We know one thing very, very clear. Most of the survivors do not want to go to the police, do not want to uh, go any criminal, do, do not want to be investigated. What they want is actually to continue their work peacefully without any threat. It's a very simple request. And many of them don't have, uh, as might be thought, venegans. Uh, they just want to go every day to work and do their work peacefully. Uh, many of the women, especially if they are not uh, powerful enough, if they read all these bureaucratical measures, they won't do anything. Even I'm thinking about myself, just hearing all what was read before, you cannot deal with that. A woman wants to come to another woman in a closed room and have someone to talk to and, and have complete uh, uh, secrecy. And then, uh, and then uh, she wants to have an advice. What should I do? Maybe, maybe the best practice will be, I just don't want to stay with that man in the same room. Just move me to another department and that will solve a solution. That's all. Some things are very simple, but what happens instead? Organizations try to uh, develop all kind of mechanisms, especially legal ones. It's not the law who solves sexual harassment in the workplace. I'm sorry to tell you, in Israel we have a very big experience. We just have new data that our organization uh, found from the, that the, uh, a, a huge percentage of cases de that deal with uh, sexual harassment close. Why do they close? And I'm sure it's everywhere in the world. It's not only in our country because there is no evidence. How can one find evidence? If a woman feels that she's abused, maybe the man doesn't know that he abused her. You're talking about the UN. It's multicultural. What is, what is okay in one country is totally a no-go in another country. The organization must understand that. That's why I think Israel is a little bit like the UN because it's very varied society. 
actually you do have all the knowledge. The knowledge is inside the organization. What I told you we do, we talk with the workers. We, for example, we do now a project with women in sports. It, was, it happened before the big case in the United States. We interviewed women who are, uh, who are really very uh, high-level sport, sport, um, sport, sport women. Mm -hmm. And they tell us what, uh, I'll give you just one example. One thing that they told us, when we go abroad to the Olympic Mission, okay, there is, a, there is this, the hotel there. And in the hotel, all the people live together, or there's a little village. And all the people live together. In that village, many things can happen. So we know that this is a hazard zone, and we have to think how to disrupt things from happening there. That's, or another one tells, when, uh, when uh, I'm in the pool and, some, uh, and my coach touches me, he must touch me. It's sports, you know, when sports are touching. But maybe he should tell me before he touches me, I'm touching you. So just so. these are very, very small practices. They don't cost money. They don't cost anything, just attention. So what I say, in the UN, within your workers, women and men, all the information exists. You should talk with them first, and they will give you the best practices uh, f uh, that the, the, and, the, and that can help you change. And I don't want to say exactly an organizational c culture. It's not a culture. It's organizational uh, um, practices and organizational situations that create harassment. Disrupt the situation, you will disrupt the harassment. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jim. Yep. Um, so just to echo what others have said, that you know, while policies, investigations, and training are important, we've learned how easily they can sorry how easily they can be subverted, and so an overemphasis on those and an underemphasis on addressing what I would still call organizational culture and abuse of power is a surefire route to failure. Um, there are so many examples in the world from the Sasa project in Uganda to the work that we do at Gender at Work on gender action learning, working with teams to help them identify where gender discrimination exists and how to combat it and how to, how to change culture, right? That, that the UN can, can build on, can learn from, can bring in, and we hope that the UN system will reach out to all of the experience and expertise there is in the world about how you subvert, how you disrupt abuse of power and create a more equitable working environment for everybody. I also want to just say one other thing. One of the most interesting or beautiful stories I've heard in the Me Too movement here is, you know, after the women in Hollywood came out and started talking about their, um, their experiences, there was a group of Amokali farm workers, low-income farm workers in Florida, who had unionized, and the women had experienced a lot of sexual harassment, and they had organized and lobbied for policies to prevent sexual harassment, and sexual harassment went way down. And so those women, the Amokali, wrote a letter of support and solidarity to the women in Hollywood saying, we actually know how to deal with sexual harassment, and we can help you, <laughs> right? And it's that kind of opportunity, I think, that we also have here. Um, how are we using our power within the UN, in member states, to reach out to those who are most vulnerable in the system and let them know that we are here to support, and we are here to listen, and we are going to be advocates with them? So hopefully that will happen, and thank you again. I want to thank all of you uh, for coming today. I think this is very much uh, really the beginning of a, of a conversation. I think one thing that has been very clear is there is a, a strong call for sexual harassment at the UN to, to not go unchallenged and to really use the momentum that exists in this moment to press for real change uh, across the UN, including in the, the sort of broader diplomatic community here. So let me thank all of you. Thanks to the panelists and, and a special thanks to the governments of Israel, Kenya and Colombia. Good afternoon.